Hello again. Welcome to uh, to our session, uh, the archaeology of non-human life, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, my co-host from the University of Manchester, uh, Professor Julian Thomas, who's going to be talking to us about non-organic life. Now with a question mark at the end of it, as just noted. Okay, this paper is a, a kind of a thought experiment on my part, in which I'm going to draw on the literature of what we might call the more than human turn, in order to try and craft a, a position on the activeness, liveliness, and sociality of material things. In this, I'm seeking a middle way between approaches inspired by Bruno Latour's argument that artifacts represent fully-fledged social actors and those grounded in practice theories, which present material entities as tools, resources, or conditions used or inhabited by human beings. In other words, I'm wanting to see human thing, sorry, material things, uh, as integral and active within uh, societies. But I also want to imagine past worlds that teem with difference and complexity rather than relatively featureless networks of human and non-human actors. And it seems to me that the place to begin in all this is with the notion of life. So I think that the concept of life can be understood in two very different ways. These may be complementary as much as they're contradictory, but each of them, I think, carries with it profound implications for the way in which we understand the nature of archaeological evidence. So in one view, life is characterized by cellular organisms distinguished by an autonomous metabolism and the ability to reproduce themselves. The other presents life as the capacity of complex and heterogeneous systems to generate emergent phenomena. That is, it's the process of the world's becoming. Now, I think this latter has bearing on recent discussions on the efficacy and affectiveness of material things. And it invites us to consider what we might mean by non-organic life. The distinction here is between seeing life as something that's contained within particular kinds of beings and seeing all things as caught up in and animated by the flows and fluxes of life. Organic life forms them, acquire energy mostly derived from photosynthesis and deploy this to build a metabolism which they use to grow, sustain themselves and reproduce. Thus, they evade the tendency of things to move towards their lowest possible energy state. Organisms are both separated their, from their environment by a membrane and highly internally compartmentalized, notably at the level of organs and cells, enabling functional differentiation and the parallel operation of innumerable biochemical processes. The bounding membrane is at once the source of the organism's individuation and its temporality and spatiality. And moreover, the membrane is the foundation of autopoiesis, the self-maintenance and reproduction, and arguably also the consciousness of the organism. As autonomous bounded entities, organisms from unicellular creatures upwards are capable of a degree of intentionality or directedness towards things like sources of sustenance. Now, all of this suggests a clear and absolute distinction between organisms, highly structured bodies that can acquire and regulate sources of energy, and bodies of inert matter. But in practice, I want to suggest that there are grey areas between life and non-life, so that it may be more appropriate to think of a continuum than a binary separation. For instance, scientists disagree over whether viruses are alive or not. Viruses are contained within a protein capsid, they carry genetic material and they evolve through natural selection, but they have no metabolism and they need to hijack the processes of a host cell in order to reproduce. Further, the initial emergence of organic life must have involved a transition between increasingly structured chemical systems, perhaps cooperating networks of nucleic acids and enzymes, and bounded forms capable of maintaining and replicating themselves. So there's a climb between the two. So, despite the distinctive character of organisms, living and non-living matter may be stratified and interpenetrating rather than separated by an unbridgeable gulf. 
This isn't an argument for a flat and homogenous universe, so much for richness and diversity that doesn't always fall into clear and pre-given categories. However, the boundary between life and non-life is one that has acquired great significance in the modern West, since it renders the latter as something that can be damaged, extracted and consumed with impunity, since it has no moral status of its own. This outlook, look, is what Elizabeth Povinelli refers to as the carbon imaginary, which contrasts metabolism and reproduction with inertia, inanimacy and barrenness. For her, this perspective can be identified with Kant, who distinguishes life from matter, which can't move itself and is consequentially inert. As Karen Barad points out, the distinction between the animate and the inanimate is even more deeply ingrained than that between culture and nature. And it's only now starting to be challenged by the emphasis on the lively and vibrant qualities of matter associated with the work of people like uh, Jane Bennett. Those non-Westerners who insist on the animacy of material things have traditionally been dismissed as primitive, irrational and fetishistic. So the Kantian view is that matter needs to be supplemented by some kind of force if it's to become organised or mobile. That is, either an external hylomorphic imposition or an internal entelechy or vital principle. But as Tim Ingold argues, it's a mistake to imagine that animacy is an inherent quality or property of material things or something that's been uh, endowed on them from outside by humans. Rather, it's the consequence of the dynamic working together of a field of relationships that makes up the world and through which entities of all kinds emerge into being. In this sense, all things are animate, but not in the same way or to the same degree or at the same time scale. This brings us to our second understanding of life, not as the prerogative of specific kinds of being, but as the capacity of an animate world to generate diversity and complexity through the process of morphogenesis. In this process, forms emerge at massively variable rates from the flux of the matter flow. They achieve coherence and then they dissipate. According to such a view, it's not individual beings that are living, but creation in its entirety. Looked at in this way, it's possible to contest the argument that only organisms are able to have overcome the universe's inexorable movement towards entropy and disorder. At the individual level, organisms perish, and it's only through reproduction that their form is maintained. But equally, emergent self-organisation is present in a variety of non-biological phenomena. And I think it can be claimed to be the principle that links together organic and non-organic aspects of the process of life. Self-organisation then can draw together different forms of matter of various kinds in order to produce novel emergent properties. This can occur spontaneously under conditions of non-equilibrium. Manuel de Landa, describes what he calls the machinic phylum, a diverse range of self-organizing processes rather, in which previously unconnected entities sync together and form new assemblages that operate to bring about tangible effects in the world. Delanda specifically draws attention to what he calls chemical clocks, systems that oscillate regularly rather than tending to equilibrium. And he emphasizes the way that matter can sometimes apparently respond to fluctuations in its surroundings. Jane Bennett, too, points to the unending processes in which matter does not come to a standstill, but self-assembles into crystals, convection currents, snowflakes, whirlpools, and weather systems, specifically where unstable conditions provide a field of individuation for emergent phenomena. Because all of these things are linked, in the continuous becoming of a world distinguished by shifting potentials, shifting temperature, um, pressure, energy, and so on, it's possible to make comparisons between processes that occur in the geological, chemical, and biological realms. The reason why we can describe some of these phenomena as the non-organic components of the process of life is because they're creative, 
because they bring new things into the world. It's creativity, though, that links organic and non-organic aspects of the process of life. Timothy Morton suggests life is more than just persistence. It's the limitless process through which the world renews itself. Individual organisms perish, but life both continues and brings forth unending novelties. In the, in the organic register, this occurs through biological evolution, so that Deleuze and Qatari describe the organism as a resting point between bursts of creativity. But equally, complex material systems composed of diverse elements, which may or may not include organic life, also generate new things, and each entity reciprocally contributes to the intertwined becoming of the whole. Existing structures are broken down, and new forms emerge from their components, locking together in unprecedented ways. Life is therefore a process of production, which generates the new and the diverse, most often out of conditions of instability and disruption. New emergent structures may subsequently fall into repetitive patterns, which can have a machine-like quality. Deleuze and Guattari describe the inorganic, the organic, and the alloplastic or social as different intensities or strata of processes, which are nonetheless comparable rather than contrasting. Indeed, one of the objectives of an investigation into all this might be to understand how these different levels of process constantly emerge out of each other and subside back. These arguments therefore acknowledge the distinctive character of organic life, but they recognise it as a specific and unusually complex instance rather than something categorically set apart. Processes of, li processes of life are continually proceeding in the world around us. But in the case of organisms, these processes become stratified and bounded within a semi-autonomous entity. Taking a slightly pejorative view of this, Feng Cha suggests that organism, organisms do not so much embody life as imprison it. Yet organisms are open and leaky systems which interpenetrate with their worlds. Indeed, they can't survive at all without being entangled and immersed in their settings. They may contain and depend upon vast numbers of viruses and microorganisms, be open to the world through respiration, take in and process food for sustenance, and absorb water and non-organic materials such as iron and calcium. They are, they are also phenomena that are realised in movement and growth, rather than existing whole and entire in a static or timeless form. So what are the implications of this for thinking about archaeological residues? I'm arguing that there is not a dividing line, but a continuum between living and non-living matter. It's by now a commonplace to say that people don't impose themselves on the world from outside, and that their ability to act is always embedded within and negotiated through confederacies or alliances of diverse entities. Getting ahead of myself, uh, including objects. But material things are not individually endowed with agency or intentionality or animated by some kind of internal vitality. And nor are they static or inert, for they're caught up in the broader processes of life and inextricably intermeshed with the growth movement, sustenance, and perishing of organisms. Now, over more than 30 years, John Barrett has laboured what I think is the really critically important point, a really important insight that archaeological materials are not a record, a representation, or an output of human social life. At various points, he suggested that these residues constitute material conditions that are inhabited by past human agencies, or tools and resources employed in human life. Or more recently, he suggested that these are sets of possibilities within which historically contingent forms of humanness might, uh, might emerge. But in any, each case, material things appear to be extrinsic to past societies and consequently comparatively static and inanimate. Once past human beings have left the stage, what remains is only so much wreckage within which the gaps and absences alert us to what might once have been. So what I think I want to try and do is to radicalise Barrett's argument 
by proposing that societies, in Alfred North Whitehead's sense, are continually shifting, growing, decaying, and unequal heterogeneous assemblages of organic and non-organic entities. While I'm personally principally interested in the doings of human beings in the past, these were always mixed up with a whole variety of different kinds of things in these machinic entities and never achieved anything in isolation. They were, as Mike Shanks would have it, always cyborgs. Our kitchen of past human action, nor the discarded material carapace. Of, instead, it's composed of su surviving components that were integral to past living worlds or forms of life that existed at some point. An archaeology of organic and non-organic life, then, offers the possibility of directly accessing the vibrant but alien gatherings that formerly occupied our world. Thanks very much.